What's going on guys, Medicine in 3 Minutes back here with another video and today we're going to be talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now we're going to get straight to the point we're going to keep this subject clear, brief and illustrated so let's get started. Now before we get into the subject uh, I just want to give you guys a little reminder to look at the illustrations and the little figures here and there just if you ever need to remember something they're very good uh, for memorization if you want to associate something associate it with the photos it really really helps. So yeah. Now, let's get straight into the facts. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common of the cardiomyopathies. It has a prevalence of 1 in every 500 individuals, so it's very likely. And the disease can be present at any age with uh, preference in, in youth or in children. So, most patients are unaware because this disease has no symptoms at all. And as a result of this, it is a huge burden become because it is very common and we can't really uh, see any symptoms when it occurs. Now, to understand this disease, we have to understand how the heart pumps blood throughout the body. Now, this is done in two different steps. So, the first stage in the cardiac cycle is diastole. So, this is the relaxation of muscle uh, and it fills the blood throughout the chambers. Now, the dilation of the muscle draws blood from the atrium. To the ventricles which causes them to fill now the second stage is going to be systole and this is actually the complete opposite of uh, diastole it is going to be a contraction of the muscle and the blood is ejected from the chamber so it, it gets removed from the chamber so going into more detail about systole so the ventricles contract and the chambers become smaller as you can see here and the blood is ejected from the ventricles at the same time the auricles are filled with blood as you can see here when the ventricles finish their contraction, the systole comes to a term. A new cycle starts and the diastole begins again. As you can see, uh, when your heart is beating, it is basically repeating that same cycle over and over again every time your heart beats. Now, it is important to notice that after systole and before ventricles start to fill, there is a small little residual amount of blood left in the ventricles. So that's important uh, to remember. Now, there is going to be something called the ejection fraction. So this is going to be... Uh, the volume ejected from the ventricles divided by the total volume. Now, this basically measures the efficiency of the ventricles and how uh, you determine whether there's a normal ejection fraction or not is if it is within 70% to 80%, then it is normal. Anything below it is abnormal. Anything above it is abnormal. So how, that's how you determine the ejection fraction. Now, there are three different classifications when it comes to a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, the first is going to be whether it's hypertrophic. Uh, this is going to be a high ejection fraction, and the muscle can contract, but it cannot relax. So it can release, but it's not very good at uh, uh, absorbing blood. Now, when it is obliterative, it has a low ejection fra uh, fraction, and the muscle can relax, but it cannot contract. So again, this is the opposite of hypertrophic and the last one is restrictive so this one it can do uh, either one of the two it is not very good at either being obliterative or hypertrophic or just being normal in general okay now moving on to the genetical side of this uh, disease so there is a gene mutation that causes the heart to become hyperfunctioning as a consequence the architecture of the muscle becomes disorganized by necrosis and fibrosis now it is an autosomal dominant disease in 60% of the cases, which means one copy of the altered gene in each cell is sufficient uh, to cause the disorder. Now, muscle cell structure called sac um, sacromeres are the basic unit of the muscle construction. They are made up of thick and thin protein filaments. Now, 40% mutations in the disease occur in the beta myosin heavy chain gene on chromosome 14, and it is unknown how mutations in uh, sarcomere related genes led to hypertrophy of the muscle in the heart. Now, let's move on to the physiopathology. So, cardiomyopathy is a disease that affects the cardiac muscle. So, a genetic abnormality of muscle proteins prevent the muscle from contracting properly. The contractility of the muscle decreases. So, the muscle becomes hypertrophied in order to compensate the decrease of, decrease of contractibility. Now, note that the septum separating the two ventricles is hypertrophied in turn, but in an asymmetrical manner, as you can see here. As a consequence, the walls around the ventricles become much bigger, and the chambers are much smaller. As you can see, we have 
a lot less room to work with rather than here when there's a, a much wider uh, ventricle and the walls are much thinner. Now, the filling or the diastole of the heart is reduced and the blood coming out is reduced. That is much more difficult for it to slip through here. And as a result, the outflow decreases, hence the name diastolic heart failure as there's not enough blood actually coming out. Now, uh, we have to understand the concept of intermittent outflow constriction. So basically, it's actually very simple. It is the narrowing of space between the atrium and the septum, which prevents blood from getting out of the ventricle. If the individual subjected to a lot of effort, the heart rate is going to increase and the space is going to become even more narrow than it is. And the combination of muscle hyper, uh, hypertrophy and the narrowing space brings us to some symptoms. So what are the symptoms? Now the patient can either be asymptomatic or symptomatic. So either one or the other. Now when it is symptomatic, there's discomfort, chest pain, shortness of breath, and palpitations. Uh, there is syncope and sudden death can be the first mani uh, manifestation in some cases. Now, there is something called systolic ejection murmur and it increases with Vesalva. Now, Vesalva is essentially whatever your, your muscles are contracting or let's say uh, you ever want to flex uh, your muscles. Now, this, this is the action of Vesalva and it essentially causes systolic murmur which is going to be which is within the first the second beat of your heart and there is a gap now that gap is going to make a, uh, a sort of whistling sound and if that whistling occurs between the s1 and the s2 which is going to be like s1 s2 if it occurs between s1 and s2 then you're dealing with systolic murmur now if it were to occur between s2 and s1 then it would be you're dealing with diastolic murmur but here we are dealing with systolic because the gap is between s1 and s2 now when you're screening, you're going to see systolic ejection murmur increasing uh, with Vesalva, and the diagnosis is going to be an ultrasound mainstay uh, diagnosis, which is going to be a ratio of width of the symptom compared to the left ventricle. So it's going to be, uh, you're, you're going to divide them, and if the ratio is going to be greater than 1.3. Now, there is a genetic uh, uh, confirmatory test, and this is going to be just to confirm that your diagnosis is correct when you do the genetic test. Now, uh, the biopsy is a mild uh, fibrodystrophy, but it is often un unnecessary and it only occurs in some small instances. Now, for the treatment, the treatments are quite simple. Now, the main one is going to be lifestyle changes. So, if you're a drinker or a smoker, obviously you want to cut those things off. You want a healthier lifestyle uh, when it comes to food, uh, stress levels, etc. Uh, there's also going to be certain medications and uh, there's also going to be surgery involved. Now, um, when it comes to HCM, HCM without obstruction, so you're going to deal with high blood pressure, you want to treat the associated uh, atrial fibrillation, and you want to give diuretics and heart transplant, but that's only in very, very small cases, so it's rarely necessary. Now, when you're dealing with HOCM treatments, uh, you want to reduce obstruction by reducing the force uh, or the strength of the heart, and you're going to have BCB, as I like to call it, which is going to be beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or rapamil, or uh, disopyramid. So yeah, I uh, just, just again want to remind you guys, check out Butchered Gardens in Eden of the Pacific. It's a really, really great book. Uh, I've already showed it in multiple videos before, so if you haven't checked it out, definitely go check it out. It's on Amazon, Kindle, Kobo, it's really everywhere, so definitely go check it out. And yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, we're definitely on the ground. We're making lots of videos. We're releasing them weekly. So definitely leave a like button. Make sure to smash that subscribe button if you're new. And leave your comments and feedback. We'd love to hear what you guys think of the videos. If there's anything we can improve. Uh, if there's anything we missed or we made any mistakes. Or if you have suggestions for newer videos. We love your guys' feedback. So definitely uh, leave comments down below. And turn on that notification button. We'll see you guys next time.